Dear friends, um, it's my pleasure to end uh, this year with two lectures. And, and um, I'm really happy that uh, Andras and Lili come, came and, and gave a crits during last three days. Uh, so those lectures um, are part of our unfinished city. So unfinished city is a three-year large-scale research project uh, conducted by the Estonian Academy of Arts uh, Faculty of Architecture. And this amazing research project uh, will be carried out thanks to the support from Capitel. So I really would like to thank personally uh, Thomas Arnus Tenu Tomik and Indrek Moratz, who is supporting us and co-working with us. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lili's song. Um, Lili is a lecturer in urban planning and design and senior research associate with the transforming urban transport role of political leadership project at the Harvard Uni University Graduate School of Design. Her research focuses on the relations between urban sustainability and livability initiatives, social spatial inequality, and race and class politics in American cities and other post-colonial contexts. Her projects, which topically span building energy uh, retrofits, sustainable urban transport, and informal street blending among others, are motivated by a common question of how historically marginalized and disenfranchised urban inhabitants and communities can drive transformative urban policy and governance in collaboration with differently situated and able partners. She holds a PhD in urban and regional planning from MIT, where her dissertation entitled Race and Place, green color jobs, and the movement for economic democracy in Los Angeles and Cleveland. Please join me welcoming Lily Song. Thank you. Hello. Um, before I start, I'd like to um, thank Andres Oyari and Tomas Tamis and the other colleagues here at ECA for their um, gracious um, hospitality and collegiality. Uh, I'd like to thank the ECA students from whom I continue to learn so much, and I feel very inspired by their enthusiasm for Estonian urbanism. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank some of my um, colleagues, my activist scholar colleagues. Um, I saw Helen Suvalisaping and Annie Muripiel is um, in the audience as well. It's really a pleasure to collaborate. Um, and so I do want to say that this image here is um, from my hometown, Los Angeles, which is a place of great uh, inequality along race and class lines, but also a place where people have been continually fighting for a more inclusive city. Um, and I'm an urban planner who comes from a community organizing background and am mostly working on the research and teaching side these days. Um, but my relationship with Estonia, so it's been just over 10 years that I've been coming to Estonia. Um, do I like Veriverst? I'm still working on it. Um, but um, it's, you know, it's a place, Tallinn especially, it's, I've greatly, um, I, I've come to greatly regard Tallinn urbanism and especially Estonian cultural and uh, spatial sensibilities. Um, and you know that hardly makes me an expert on Estonia or Tallinn. Really, uh, many of the d ideas that I'm presenting today, they've emerged in conversations that I've had with um, people, you know, some of the um, aforementioned. And um, it's really coming out of an appreciation and concern for Tallinn. And um, the ideas here are put for consideration um, and decision-making by, by the public. Um, so I'll start by saying uh, global inequality is on the rise. It is worse than at any time since the 19th century. And um, so 1%, Oxfam International has been especially integral in sharing this research that 1% of the population have nearly half the world's wealth. And if these current trends continue, then the top 1% will have two thirds of the world, world's wealth by 2030. And um, since the 1980s, 
Income inequality has increased in nearly all countries, but at different rates. And this is a trend that has grown especially worse since the 2007 global economic crisis. And um, last year alone, 82% of global wealth generated went to the, the top 100% of um, the top wealthiest, 100, one, sorry, 1%. And so um, the story is that economic productivity, it continues to rise. You know, there's more to go around, but it's really that the rich who are, the rich are getting so much richer, while the poor are not getting that much poorer, um, mostly because of India and China, they've done so much to raise their poor. Um, but, but it's really the middle class at a global level that has um, stagnated. So why does inequality matter? Um, I think the popular conception is that inequality is bad for the poor, right? Um, but it turns out that in, it doesn't harm the poor alone. Um, this book here, it's called The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better. It was published in 2009, written by two British soci social epidemiologists, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson. And so the, the research reveals that inequality is detrimental to all of society by eroding trust, increasing anxiety and illness, and encouraging excessive consumption. So they looked at some key health and social indicators um, across countries, and they found that in unequal rich countries, um, people perform worse in terms of physical health, mental health, drug abuse, education, imprisonment, obesity, social mobility, trust and community life, violence, teenage pregnancies, and child well-being. So this isn't just the poor from these rich countries, but when you look at all of the population. And so um, I know the book was translated into 23 foreign editions. I don't know if English is included. I mean, sorry, Estonia is included. Um, English is, obviously. <laughs> so um, you can see here, um, this, is, this is from their website, which is very good, very informative, equalitytrust.org.uk. And you can see here that countries where, like where I'm from, the USA, it does pretty well in terms of gross national income per capita, but terribly in terms of life expectancy. And um, it's a place that has a very high Gini coefficient. It's very unequal. And I put the star there for Estonia because um, it wasn't on here. But the life expectancy is some, something just above 77, close to 78. And then the income was somewhere near um, Portugal. So not bad, right? Um, and, and these were the um, health and social indicators that they were able to, um, to compare across all of these countries. And you can see here, again, they, start, they mapped out many of these countries in terms of this index. And, um, you know, again, the U.S. is an outlier, and um, I couldn't find the data for Estonia, but I don't know where it would go exactly, I guess... These questions remain, um, you know, they, they, they merit further investigation. And so um, if it's not reason enough that inequality is bad for society, um, inequality is also bad for economic growth. And this is according to OECD researchers. Um, and the argument is that low-income people suffer poor health and low productivity, which detracts from work and income. Um, people struggle to finance investments in education because of their economic situation. There's, because um, the wealthy spend lesser as a fraction of their income on consumer and goods than the lower and middle classes who also spend a comparable amount in, you know, just like food and laundry and detergent and these things, it lowers aggregate demand, which lowers, you know, growth. Um, inequality threatens public confidence in growth-boosting policies like free trade. Very good example is the United States right now where people are mobilizing against free trade. There's a lot of problems with free trade, but one of the things it does is boost growth, right? And the other thing is that inequality could lead to economic and financial instability as households borrow to prop up consumption because they're so much in, depth, right? in, in debt. 
So is inequality an issue for Estonia? You know, when you look at these um, countries, it doesn't look terribly bad, right? Um, but some, do you know this guy? I don't, I don't know him, but I found this um, online. This is Swedbank SD CEO Robert Kitt. And um, he, he was on record saying that although the Estonian economy is doing better than ever before, economic inequality in society is also greater than it has ever been. Um, and the trends are that, you know, it's, it's been on the rise, right, since the 90s. And I'm, I'm just paraphrasing him, but he says that new business models and smarter industry lead to a situation in which certain groups, and he's, he talks specifically about less educated men, and um, elderly women who are who are more educated um, are left behind. So, in terms of what to do about it, um, the World Inequality Report. This is a very good resource. It comes out of the Paris School of Economics, um, and it's led by renowned researchers like Thomas Piketty, um, and they study global income and wealth inequality based on the World Wealth and Income Database which is an international open source database maintained by over 100 researchers in five continents. And so they put out some recommendations to address growing inequality on, around the world, and um, they were threefold. The first is that countries should raise taxes on the rich. Second, that countries should share data on financial assets of the wealthy to address rampant ta tax evasion. And third, that countries should redistribute income through cash transfers, investments in education, environmental, um, improving environmental conditions, and then trying to stabilize employment. Um, but the bad news is, is that in recent decades, countries have grown richer, but governments on the whole have grown poorer, right? And this is, for the most part, people point to the proliferation of neoliberal policies where um, there's a tendency to shrink government and um, the public coffers. Um, and, you know, indeed, but countries can, you know, and still do a lot, though some seem to do more than others. But, um, you know, the national level isn't the only one for intervention. And I'm here to tell you that cities can also play a role in both perpetuating and less lessening inequality. Um, so this is, if you look at different countries, sort of what their, um, after their national redistribution um, policies, you know, how much inequality shrinks or it doesn't. And I think Estonia was actually on here. Yeah, top fourth, right? So, yeah. Yeah, top six. Right. Yeah. So not bad in terms of inequality, relatively speaking. Not great in terms of national redistribution policy compared to some others. Okay, so um, why, on the whole, cities tend to be more unequal compared to other places. And um, this is due to some key factors. So by definition, cities have a higher, they have higher concentrations of people and economic activity and they have higher flows of capital, goods, services, and information. And for these reasons, they attract people both on the higher and the lower spectrums of income and educational um, distributions. Um, so you get sort of a higher right, income inequality for that reason, higher income and then lower income people. Um, also, there's urban agglomeration effects of greater productivity and innovation. And so, you know, because there's all these high concentrations of people, economic activity, capital, goods and services, cities are more productive and they generate more profits for companies. Um, these are not always equitably distributed, right? But um, so, you know, that's on the higher income and wealth end. But also there's locational advantages in cities like ports, you know, harbors and other key infrastructures that make cities more productive and also places of more um, income inequality. Um, but the other thing is that we are in a particular era right now, and this is something that we all need to consider and really watch out for, which is the er era of urban-based economic development. And this is different from previous decades of industrial economic development where um, 
economic productivity and labor was tended to be um, you know more distributed and really based on manufacturing sectors. Now we're really in an era where urban locations, so knowledge sectors, but also corporate services, tourist services, consumer services like food and beverages, these are the things that are driving growth in a lot of advanced or late industrial economies, um, of which Estonia is arguably a member. And also, um, there's a lot of profit generation through real estate investments and remaking places. And we see, you know, cranes and we see a lot of that playing out in Tallinn as well. So how do urban policies and planning interventions shape inequality? So um, housing policies, they define the supply, quality, and affordability of housing options, right? Public transportation policies enable access to mobility options and opportunities, but it really depends on what kind of mode you're in, you know, automobile, whether you're a transit user, pedestrian. Um, locationally, they're not even across the place, right? So whether, in, you know, you're in central talent versus an outlying area is very different and socially uneven. So, you know, depending on whether you're able-bodied or not, or elderly or not, you know, a child or not, like, these things have very uneven impacts. Um, urban economic and workforce development policies also structure income and wealth creation opportunities. Um, and then public amenities and services, along with open and green spaces, shape quality of life, how people interact, and also human development possibilities. So I'll go through these um, one by one. There's LA again. Okay, so, and I'm going, I'm considering these one by one in the context of, of talent especially. Um, so housing, in terms of housing, in um, Estonia and in Tallinn, the Soviet social housing legacy has promoted high levels of home ownership. And yet um, there has been somewhat lacking attention to modernization and upgrades of the social housing stock. And I know a lot of that is now being considered in some of the ECA courses, right, and, and research. Um, but besides the um, sort of deteriori deteriorating quality of social housing, utility costs are going up for people, you know, heat, electricity, water, and that makes, that especially burdens low income and elderly residents who are often found in these um, districts, in these housing districts. At, on the other side, um, there's been weak limits on leapfrog development and urban sprawl, which are very much about car-oriented development, especially suburban neighborhoods, which tend to be segregated by class and um, ethnicity. And, you know, um, Tit Tamaru and his colleagues at Tartu University have really been um, the leaders in, you know, in, in research and sharing this work with the public, um, as, you, as you probably all know. Um, the other thing <clears throat> that we see here, especially in Kalamaya, is that the newly built housing and the urban core tends to be luxury, right? Not very much um, accessible for um, many households in, in Tallinn, especially with families. Um, at the same time, when you look at newly built social housing, we see that they tend to um, isolate low-income households. I'm thinking of the, um, the social housing in Lasname for sing um, households that, that are headed by single mothers and low income, so they're not within close access to a lot, a lot of what the city offers, right? Um, and the other thing is that the weak limits on foreign investment and ownership allow real estate speculation. So it's pretty, it's relatively easy in Estonia compared to other countries for foreigners to invest, you know, in a property, rent it out on Airbnb, manager comes, you know, does everything for you, and then just extract the profits. But that's really detrimental to affordability options for talenters. Um, and then there's a lack of affordable housing policy at the local level. So um, a, a lot of cities, um, especially in the U.S., which is not a leader in this area, has been adopting inclusionary zoning. So if you're a developer, you build a big project, you know, 15, 20 percent of it has to be affordable units for people who, under, who earn under a certain amount. 
Public transportation in Tallinn. Um, so we see that auto-oriented development has prevailed since the 90s. If you look at transport infrastructure investments, if you look at private developments, you know, like malls or housing, it's very much, you know, for the car driveways, you know, where you go in. Um, and since the 90s, there's, I found data um, that car ownership has gone up sixfold in the period. Um, the modal hierarchy, so besides the fact that things are, that people are driving a lot, there is a modal hierarchy that is evident in some of the transportation policies. So by modal hierarchy, I mean, what is the power dynamic between people in different modes? If you're in a car versus if you're in a pedestrian, if you're a pedestrian. And so one of the things that really stand out to me is the, the fact that these mandated pedestrian reflectors. So if you're a pedestrian, you have to wear this thing, right? Um, or the fact that, you know, here by Baltium, um, there's these pedestrian tunnels, right? So that, that pedestrians are the ones that are watching out for the cars or yielding to the cars, that suggests that there's a modal hierarchy where cars are, you know, um, sort of more primary. And I've debated this with Daori Tuvikana. I don't know if he's here today, but we've debated the reflectors. You know, I know they, you know, I know the Finns do it, it's dark here, but you know, I, I'm gonna say that there's a modal hierarchy there. Um, okay, the other thing, I mean, there's a strong Soviet um, legacy of electric trams and regional trains that have been upgraded, right? Um, and there's free public transit for Talliners, um, which, you know, some researchers have studied. Um, but despite that, there's lagging infrastructure and investments in route expansion. So it's really the train cars that have been improved and the fares are, you know, free. Um, but then the routes haven't really expanded over time, right? It's exciting. I heard from Andres Oyeri there's plans for a multimodal station at Ulemiste, so the buses and the trams and, you know, the trains will be integrated, which is very convenient for transit users. Um, one of the things that really strikes me is how walkability improvements seem to be very uneven and hard fought. Um, the Sorry, my Estonian pronunciation needs some work. Um, but the, the Main Streets project, right? So um, even that seems to be kind of, you know, increasingly watered down and threatened. Um, cycling gaining popularity. Last summer I came here, I was so excited to see at Tileskivi, there was a critical mass, so many cyclists, um, you know, out there enjoying themselves. Um, and it seems a lot of people are doing this for leisure and recreation, but there's been slower um, improvements and in infrastructure improvements for utility cycling. And by that, I mean cycling like every day to go to work, pick up your kids, et cetera, as opposed to leisure and recreation. So economic and workforce development is something that is um, interesting in Tallinn because of the strength of the tech sector. And there seems to be a lot of emphasis on the tech sector as the silver bullet, you know, like we don't have a Nokia, you know, there's many, right? Um, but the question is, is that the silver bullet? Is that sort of the magic solution? Or is it a tale of two Amazons, right? This tale of two Amazons is about these very highly paid executives on one hand, and then the low wage workers, you know, who are in, who don't have job security. Um, they are in these dead end, very manual jobs, right? And so I think that's a question. It's not a um, assertion. It's really a question about how can we make Talon's tech sector, um, you know, kind of robust in terms of all the options at different skill levels and also offer career pathways for lower skilled workers as well. Um, the high dependence on tourism and the related food and beverage industry um, can also, could also, you know, has a risk of generating pretty low wage jobs without um, career pathways. Um, I learned from one of the, the thesis projects that 30% of Estonians work in the manufacturing sector still. M much of it seems to be outside of Tallinn. I learned a lot about Mardu, but there's other places too, obviously. Um, and uh, it's unclear, you know, whether they're a source of semi-skilled and middle income employment or if it tends to be more on the lower income side. And if the semi-skilled and middle income employment sectors are mostly outside of cities like Tallinn. Um, one of the worrisome trends is that the wages and pensions for jobs in the public sector and education and healthcare sectors are, are not keeping pace with the rising cost of living. You know, I hear a lot about how it's expensive to buy food here compared to the, the pensions that many people are receiving. 
Um, and the fact that there's such high ownership of retail chains and shopping centers means that a lot of those profits get repatriated back to the UK, Norway, you know, the places where these companies are from. And then that kind of constrains the multiplier effect. So part of what urban economic growth is about is that, you know, you work at ECA, you make your salary, you go to, you know, Teleskivi, you have dinner, you know, that per the worker then earns his income and he goes to sell and he buys something. And, you know, and that, th that multiplier effect is what creates more opportunities, economic opportunities that continue to grow in um, talent. But when the ownership is foreign, they take those profits and that goes to the UK. And that multiplier effect occurs within the UK. And so that is a worrisome trend. Um, High unemployment and underemployment among the elderly and low pay among women could also be a concern. Within Estone, um, Europe, I was really surprised to find that Estonia has especially high um, gender-based income gaps and that um, Tallinn has, or Estonia has also a, a large proportion of female-headed households. And so um, it's surprising, you know, I, I know a lot of strong, very intelligent Estonian women, and to under, you know, to it's hard to understand like why they should earn less than their male counterparts, right? Um, public amenities and services. Oh yeah, that's some of the data on that. I'll skip through. Public amenities and services. Um, you know, like I said, the retail grocery stores and shopping malls, they tend to be or, um, auto-oriented. A lot of them are in suburban areas. The ones in the city center, like Viru and, um, oh, what's the other one? Solaris. I always forget Solaris. You know, they're more, they're transit-oriented, but they tend to be higher cost, right? Less affordable for many people. Public markets remain popular, um, but in recent years, upgrades and redevelopment, like here with at Baltiama, Turk, right, um, has raised questions about affordability and retail gentrification. I've learned that the owner there has allotted some affordable, um, what do you call them, slots to some of the vendors so that they can come and have cheaper rent. But you know, it's not a policy, right? So if that owner didn't want to do that, it wouldn't, you know, be mandated. Um, you know. We love our saunas here, right? So strong historical legacy of saunas, stadiums, and sports fields. These are free places or really cheap places where people could go and regardless of class interact, right, enjoy themselves. Um, public schools seem to be pretty strong compared to a lot of places on the whole, but differing in quality across different neighborhoods. Um, and same with the vocational schools. Um, cultural planning wise, Estonia seems to do very, you know, well, the li libraries and song festival grounds compared to a lot of other countries. Um, one of the tr things that I noticed is that there's such wonderful museums like the Seaplane Hangar Museum or Kumu, or, you know, and, um, but the costs are high and I just wonder how affordable that could be for locals who should obviously go and enjoy these places. Um, open and green spaces. There was a thesis project yesterday about the green belt around the historic city. What a wonderful amenity. Um, parks and playgrounds in Soviet era housing district um, and, and urban core neighborhoods alike are very positive. Um, some of the things that are a bit concerning, public landmarks like the waterfront and the beach are not as well connected ped for pedestrians, um, for people who live you know, in nearby neighborhoods or might wanna walk there from the old town. Radite project, um, you know, some people in this room have strong feelings about that. Um, you know, it's going by, what is it, a six lane highway, the only one so far since the 90s in the urban core that cuts by the old town port and seaside and is worsening this connectivity issue between these places and a cherished public landmark like the waterfront, right? Um, the relative, oh, compared to a lot of cities, there's forests and bogs and lakes and things nearby the city, but they tend to be more destinations rather than places where people go all the time um, or, you know, on a sort of daily routine. And um, walkable neighborhoods like Kadri York or even Kalamaya seem to be pretty scarce and uneven in distribution thus far. And so, you know, I'm putting out the inclusive city as an ideal, you know, an ideal that all sort of urbanites and lovers of urbanism may aspire to. 
Um, it, it, by inclusion, I mean, you know, it's not just enough to be somewhere, but ha to be long, right? And for development to actually serve, you know, one's, one's um, interests as well. And I, th I would argue that the inclusive city and for talent to be more, a more inclusive city, we have to interrogate or question or push back on the logics of urban development, right? And by that I mean this neoliberal sort of private sector leadership and shaping policies and markets and the idea that trickle down growth is gonna happen somehow. You know, if we have a strong tech sector, right? If we somehow do what talent, is it Talink? The, you know, ferry ship companies, if, you know, if we could only just support them, then we'll all somehow be okay. Um, pushing back on that, but also pushing back on the fact that the current market economy and political system, it integrates most people besides the super wealthy and in, in denigrating, you know, in subordinating terms, right? And they're delivering highly unequal cities. And there is nothing natural about these things, right? These are political problems that require public awareness and mobilization and intervention. And so, you know, the question I pose is like, what are the economic, political, social, and spatial structures that are creating this or worsening this inequality? Um, spatially speaking, I think it's really important to start off by Re, uh, recognizing that a lot of the policies in the city are designed for a particular person, which tends to be a male who's able-bodied, right? A lot of the intersections, you gotta move really fast, going into the pedestrian tunnels, the stairs, and you know, um, a lot of the routes as well of transit, it's about commute patterns. Um, and, and the cycling system, you really have to be a healthy and kind of brave, like almost kamikaze type of like cyclist to really do that on a daily level, right? And so really thinking about um, the other people who live in the city and how can we build a city around their needs. Um, and I think this requires acknowledging that, you know, people in the room here, people making decisions, designing cities, we're all people and we are very limited in what we know and what we understand. So it's very important to reach out and to overcome our own blind spots as as humans. I know there's a lot of activists, scholars, and students who've been interviewing people who live in the neighborhoods, questioning, you know, for whom is this improvement, right? Who should be the ones who implement these changes, right? So I think that kind of partnership is, is very important because it does take different types of knowledge, skills, and experience to address urban dilemmas and challenges, and especially to overcome these political sort of issues that are preventing transformative changes that are happening in, in Tallinn. And so I'll stop and I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Oh, okay. I could also circle back. Should we take a vote? Let's come back. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. So Andre is well known, but I'm still make a small introduction. So Andre Sevchuk is an assistant professor of urban planning at Harvard Graduate School of Design. His research interests include urban design and spatial analysis, modeling and visualization, urban and real estate uh, economics, transit and pedestrian-oriented development, spatial adaptability, and urban history. <coughs> 
and this has worked with a number of city governments, international organizations, planning practices, and developers on urban design, plans and policies in both developed and rapidly developing urban environments. Most recently, including those uh, in Indonesia and Singapore. He is the author of the Urban Network Analysis Toolbox, which is used by researchers and practitioners around the world to study spatial relationship in cities along networks. He had led various international research projects, exhibited his research at TEDx, the World City Summit, and in the Venice Biennale. And he received the uh, President's Design Award in Singapore. International Parkminster Fuller Prize and uh, Ron Brown Fulbright Fellowship. He was previously an assistant professor of architecture and planning at the Singapore University of Technology and Design and a lecturer at MIT. Please join me in welcoming Andres Sevchuk. Thank you. And I uh, also would like to first extend uh, my thanks to the department uh, uh, for the invitation and for a very stimulating uh, three days of reviews. And it's really such a pleasure to see the school back in one building. Uh, it has been uh, kept apart for too long. I feel like everybody's sort of happy in the building to be uh, back in the same space. So that includes me. Um, so what I'll talk about today um, is um, street commerce. And by, by that, I mean the um, patterns and distributions of not just retail, but also service amenities, um, personal services, food and entertainment, and the kinds of things that create strong uh, street edges in cities. Um, I'll talk about it um, in an international context, somewhat theoretically, but also apply uh, some of the thoughts to Tallinn as we go along. And I, as, we, as I go through this, I try to argue that um, uh, street commerce or a vibrant and, and um, equal or uh, diverse street commerce is actually also part of what um, Lily was eloquently uh, referring to uh, as part of inclusive cities. Uh, because it makes um, amenities accessible to different demographic groups throughout the city. It doesn't require uh, large capital investments in cars and so on. Uh, it has major public health benefits, reductions in, uh, in obesity levels, as well as uh, other um, major uh, health benefits in, in uh, 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 public health. It has strong multiplier effects because street commerce, as Lily already mentioned, tends to be smaller local scale with more local ownership and uh, procuring services uh, from other local companies, thereby creating much stronger multiplier effects um, um, and so on. So the list of um, benefits is large and, and it's almost to the point where I think when I go around cities um, around the world, um, the strength of st street commerce is almost like a barometer of the health of um, uh, the city. If it's, if it's, if it's absent, if, if it's not doing well, uh, and if the city is privatizing into sort of more remote um, shopping malls and, and less public realm on city streets, I regard it as, as, a, as a negative indicator. And the opposite, of course, is true. Um, so um, I'll, I've structured this presentation around uh, six brief topics that I try to get into. Uh, first, I'll present a macro picture of how street commerce is distributed in cities. Then I'll uh, present a very micro picture about what it really takes for one single store to survive and how we sometimes have to think through that lens when we write policy and plans uh, for healthy street commerce. Uh, I'll, I'll touch upon some economic models of street commerce, talk about clustering and why we we find oftentimes stores of different types clustering with each other. Uh, models of coordination among stores um, that can help not just one, but a, a range of stores act as a, as a unity or as a, as a cohesive whole. Um, and finally, um, uh, touch upon some bigger picture uh, topics of how urban design and density are directly uh, related to um, the amount of street commerce that city can produce. So starting with the macro picture, um, it turns out that actually street commerce at, its, at a very high level, or let, we can even generalize that, the presence of retail service and food establishments in cities are 
surprisingly predictable at some level. So if we look at how clusters of street commerce are distributed in cities, and by clusters in this context, I mean, I, mean, I, I have a very um, basic definition of what a cluster is, which it requires at least an X number of stores, and the stores have to be at least uh, at most a certain distance from each other. So what I'm going to use um, in the following is defining clusters that you have to have at least 25 amenities and no amenity can be further than 100 meters from the, its neighboring amenity and that's the definition of a cluster. If I apply that to Tallinn, then Tallinn actually has a pretty robust set of pockets of street commerce all over the place. Uh, the largest, of course, is the old town with over 400 businesses in one sort of continuous necklace uh, or, or a web uh, such that the stores are no longer than 100 meters further apart. But you find them in Lasnama, you find them at the Numa Center, you find them in Uisma uh, uh, and, and other parts um, of the city in Buhya Tallinn and so on. And this is very common, uh, not just for Tallinn, but for any city. Here are uh, some images of retail clusters in some U.S. cities I've recently studied. Uh, these are clusters of street commerce in Los Angeles. Here I no longer show every unique store uh, individually, but the radius of the circle represents the size of the cluster. Um, you see them distributed from downtown L.A. to the, to the west side in Santa Monica and the beach. Um, this is Washington, D.C. and the distribution of um, clusters. This is Boston, uh, where we live. And um, Cambridge, Somerville, and some of the adjacent towns around it. Now, if we plot, um, if we actually just count the number of retail service and food amenities in a city and plot its relationship with the metropolitan population, then there's a surprisingly strong relationship. This, the, this trend line here is the relationship between the number of residents in the metropolitan area and on the y-axis, the number of um, establishments. And there is surprisingly little scatter around the line. If the, you know, and that basically indicates that the metropolitan population is a very robust predictor of how many amenities a town will have. So as an example, for instance, if I use this exact equation of the trend line to predict individual cases in the US context, if we take, for instance, the Washington, Arlington, Alexandria metro population, which is about 5.5 million people, then this trend line predicts that the, this is the average trend line of all cities in the US, it predicts that this uh, metro area should have about 46,000 retail food and personal service establishments. The actual number is 41,000. So it's not far off. And you can see that scatter is present in the lower spectrums a little bit more and less in larger towns. But all in all, um, it's a very uh, strong predictor. So on the one hand, the amount of commerce in any city is highly predictable. The second uh, sort of regularity aspect that's somewhat surprising, there's a famous um, a law called a Zips Law, which is oftentimes used in uh, geography. In fact, Zips Law, Zips uh, was a linguist, and, and he noticed this sort of interesting anomaly that certain words are used exponentially more often in languages than other words. And in the English language, the word the, T-H-E, uh, is by far the most used word and the second ranked word is used almost half as, uh, uh, half as often, and the third ranking word is used more or less three times less often as the first ranked word. So basically, he observed that there is this exponential distribution in frequencies, and this law has been applied to many things, including city sizes. So for instance, in most countries, the city sizes are uh, distributed more or less following Zip's law, that there's one very strong dominating city, uh, a couple of half that size cities, and lots and lots of lots of small cities. Uh, surprisingly, Zip's law also describes very well uh, retail distribution patterns in cities. Most cities have one dominant downtown retail um, cluster, uh, a few um, sort of uh, two, uh, one, two or three um, clusters that are maybe half that size, and lots and lots and lots of um, small clusters, as you also noticed in Tallinn. It's usually plotted this way as a log-log relationship between rank and size, and the fact that this data follows a linear trend line basically confirms that there is an exponential um, uh, decay rate so that there are exponentially more uh, large centers, I mean, small centers than uh, large centers. So just to take you as an example, in one particular city in Phoenix, Arizona, if we take Zip's law at the national scale in the US and uh, plot the average trend um, of how uh, um, center sizes are distributed, then how does it predict a particular city? For instance, it says that the Zip's law, given the population size of Phoenix, Arizona, it would predict that 
uh, Phoenix would have 25 retail clusters that have between 25 and 52 establishments. So these are very small clusters. Uh, the actual number is 23. That it would have nine clusters uh, with 50 to 100 stores. The actual number is eight. Uh, and it predicts that um, it has three clusters so the size of uh, 100 to 200 stores. Uh, the actual number is also three. So it's spot fairly close to actually um, these distributions. Uh, however, it misses the largest cluster. It predicts that um, given the size of Phoenix, it shouldn't have any clusters with more than 4,000 stores. In fact, Phoenix has one. So it's not um, exactly accurate, but it's a fairly um, surprising trend that not only is the number of stores predictable by city size, which is kind of logical from an economic perspective, but the center size distribution is always exponential. Um, and it holds in almost every city uh, with some um, uh, slight differentials. But however, if we think of cities as our um, own experiences, then we know that cities differ. They don't feel the same, and even street commerce does not feel predictable. It is actually subject to a lot of policy and uh, larger economic forces that shape it, and not all cities feel alike, nor uh, do their retail patterns look alike. So if you think about, these are a few downtown um, examples from uh, the U.S. context, even if we look at the size of the largest cluster with respect to all of the retail the city has, then for instance, in New York, uh, the largest cluster, which is basically lower Manhattan, comprises a third of all the stores in New York City. However, in Los Angeles, the largest cluster, which is downtown, comprises only about 14% or half that proportion as New York. So the, the largest dominant cluster size, even proportionately, actually differs quite a bit. And if we take an extreme case like Houston, Texas, which is a super car oriented city, then the downtown cluster only holds about 1% of all stores um, in the city. The rest distributed um, in, in lots and lots and lots of smaller clusters. Um, and if you actually look at the how this zips flaw trend, this sort of log-log relationship which draws a linear line, surprisingly, the slope of that line differs by city, and the intercept of that line also differs by city. So what does it tell us? The intercept tells us that the, um, the absolute sort of size of the largest cluster varies a lot, and this is not so unexpected because c bigger cities obviously have a uh, larger dominant cluster, but the slope also differs, which tells us that the, the way that this exponential distribution works, that whether you have you know, one large one and two that are half that size and, and then four that are uh, a third of that size and so on, or, or is it in some other proportion, that's described by the slope of this line. And that also varies from city to city. So some are steeper slopes and some are others, which basically tells us the distribution, uh, the rank size distribution varies from city to city. So there is actually, in reality, um, if we start looking at the specific cases, uh, a, a real um, plethora of variation. So these mega trends, the macro picture that it seems predictable with these overall scaling laws, if we actually hone in into particular cities, it is not so predictable. And here's a, a hone, zoomed in version of this um, same line that I pr started out with at the metro, if we compare the metropolitan population to the number of stores in cities, then if we zoom into one part of that line, that scatter becomes actually quite significant, which looked fairly tight in the first slide I showed. So for instance, um, uh, some of the cases uh, that are fairly strong outliers, for instance, Myrtle Beach in South Carolina is a city that has much more retail establishments than its metropolitan population would predict. It's far off the line. And this is obviously because Myrtle Beach is actually a huge tourist attraction. It's a, it's a beach town with lots of amenities. So the, the uh, retail uh, patterns in that city are not explained by the metropolitan population. They're explained by the visitors. And same, for instance, for San Luis Obispo, if anybody's been to the wine country in California, it's a wine town. And everybody from Los Angeles and San Francisco drives their car down there, and it creates much more demand for retail um, and service amenities than the size of the town would predict. So this obviously holds for other towns around the world, too, if you have more passersby, more visitors, that boosts up the numbers, and even passersby and visitors from other neighboring towns. So that's the big picture. Now, it oftentimes is important to look at street commerce in particular cities through the lens of the actual operators. The, the individual unit of what makes street commerce possible is the single store. So let's look at how a single, what it takes to actually have a single store survive. Here's a, a very kind of typical generic uh, coffee shop in the United States called Starbucks. Um, what does it take for 
um, startup, Starbucks to break even? How many people are needed to support a single Starbucks? So if we look at it from the perspective of the shop owner, the shop owner has to pay rent. In this case, um, the rents are pretty steep. Uh, this is nearby Harvard Square, so this is around $12,000 a month. Uh, it also pays utility costs like electricity, water, cleaning. Uh, it has staff, oftentimes quite a lot of staff actually. Um, so uh, 10 baristas and two managers approximately. So it, it, it faces roughly $16,000 worth of uh, wages or salaries every month. So if you put those together, it costs about $30,000 to run a single Starbucks every month. Now, if 70% of the store's proceeds uh, that come in over the counter with people paying for coffee and pastries, if about 70% of that is actually spent on those fixed costs, which include rent, uh, wages, and utilities, uh, then we can compute um, how much, how many customers it actually takes to sustain a store. And so in this case, it takes about 281, or let's say 280, 300 customers per day on average to sustain this Starbucks. If in the long run it has fewer customers, it won't break even. And if we look at how frequently people um, purchase coffee, then uh, if we ever, for instance, if we say that only one in 40 people in this area consumes coffee regularly from Starbucks, then it takes about 11,000 people in this neighborhood to sustain the store, to sustain these 300 or 280 purchases per day. So let's say 11,000 people to sustain this uh, or 281 purchases per day. That's coffee, which everybody drinks. What about a different store? This is a store I used to walk by when I lived in London for a while, uh, for a few months. It's called Get Stuffed. It's a taxidermy store. Basically, what they do is they stuff live animals. Uh, dead animals, sorry. Previously, <laughs> previously live animals, um, they bring them back to life. Um, and whenever I walked by, this is on Essex Road in London, I couldn't help but think, how many people does it take to sustain a store like that? I mean, who buys taxidermied animals? How often? And this is like, it's amazing that this store even exists. So let's look at it. This is the interior, by the way. Um, this is a family-owned business. You can actually look it up. It's called getstuff.com, I think. Um, it's family-owned business, so therefore they own the real estate. They don't have to pay rent. Um, it, the utilities are perhaps about $2,000 a month. And then there's three people who run it. Uh, it's a family, um, so they draw maybe about $6,000 a month of wages. And all in all, it takes only $8,000 a month to run the store. So remember, Starbucks was about $30,000 a month. This is much cheaper, $8,000 a month. If the store, if for every pound that comes across the counter, if they spend about 57% um, on fixed costs, which is, again, uh, rent, utilities, and wages, then we can, co again, compute. Um, and we, uh, we also know what the average customer spends, in this case, uh, close to $500 per animal. Uh, we can compute how many people the store requires per day to play, uh, break even. So if we look at this 8,000 divided by um, $265, which go towards fixed cost, this store actually only requires one person a day to break even. This is because the, exp the expense that comes in over the counter is much more, this is 460 pounds, uh, and if 57% if of that goes to fixed cost, that's enough to actually cover wages, utilities, and rent. But even though it needs only one customer a day to break even, how big of a market area does it need? Remember, the coffee place uh, required around 280 people per day, so so many more than this. So you would imagine that this maybe has a smaller market area, but no, the opposite is true because people don't buy stuffed animals very often. If we assume that, for instance, the uh, one in 10,000 Londoners buys a stuffed animal and they do so only once in three years, then it takes the entire metropolitan area of London to sustain this store. Indeed, when I looked it up, I found one taxidermy store in London at the time. So this was, this, even though you only need one person a day, it requires the entire metropolitan area to sustain itself. And this is basically to, communicate or illustrate the point that different types of stores require very different market areas to break even. And um, these market areas usually differ by, most, most often they differ by the frequency of visits. Things that are visited more frequently, we find a lot more in cities. We find a lot more bakeries and coffee shops than we find art galleries or taxidermy stores, which are visited much less frequently. This is a plot of people per store 
in different store categories. Um, uh, th this data comes from um, U.S. cities. So I've taken the average, and on average, actually, for instance, uh, you only require 440 people um, in a city to sustain a restaurant or a food place. However, at the other extreme, um, if you look at garden equipment stores selling like lawn mowers and things, on average, there's 14,500 people per store in cities. So there's a wide range um, of how big of a market area a store needs to survive. And these error bars that you see on the, on the graph itself, they, sh they show the range between cities. So some cities actually have much larger um, uh, population needs to sustain a gardening store than others. And this is largely because of climate reasons. So you have cities in moderate climates, you have a lot of gardens that produces a lot of gardening stores, but, but, but in cities like New York, for instance, people don't have lawns and, and yards. Um, you don't have much fewer gardening stores per capita. So there's a wide, wide variation in mo many of these stores, including, uh, for instance, automobile stores. So how, does the, how do economic models explain this picture? The most famous economic model, which actually has interesting connections back to Estonia and Tartu University, um, is central place theory, uh, because we have a, a geographer called Edgar Kant, who studied in Germany and almost contemporaneously described the system of central places in Estonia as the now famous Walter Kerstaller did for Germany. Uh, so central place theory is a sort of uh, the very first rudimentary economic I don't want to even say model, it's more of a diagram this, that describes how central places, and these are usually, in Chris Taller's example, commercial hubs or commercial centers are distributed in cities. And it essentially relies on two ideas. Uh, Chris Taller said that the market areas around stores that I just alluded to with the example of taxidermy store and a coffee shop are determined by two things. First, the range, which describes the maximum distance a person is willing to walk to the store and threshold, which describes the minimum number of people a store needs to break even economically. And the combination of these ranges and thresholds, according to Chris Taller, generate these hexagonal market areas. If This is an, an ideal scenario, that if you have competing stores that sell the exact same thing, then Chris Taller would argue that they would distribute themselves equally across the landscape, each one having an equilibrium, the exact same market area. However, different types of goods that are not directly competing with each other have different market areas. So the taxidermy store is the highest order good that requires the greatest market area of all, which is only found in very, very, very few centers. Um, and therefore, it requires a very large market area. But there's sub-centers that are smaller and smaller and smaller until the very small sort of local corner shop cluster um, and those are found in um, many, many cases. So Chris Taller basic, basically describes that there are these overlapping hexagonal market areas, and each hexagon uh, has a different size. Therefore, it describes the catchment need or necessary market area of stores. Um, and what's present in the lower order centers is also present in the higher order centers, but not the other way around. So for instance, you find uh, uh, bakeries in the lower order centers, which you would also find in the higher order centers, but you would here also have things like department stores and jewelry stores that you would never have in lower order centers because they require such vast uh, market areas to break even. What's actually really uh, uh, maybe just a, a strike of luck or intuition on behalf of Chris Taller is that if you lay out this pattern of center sizes, then actually if you, if you plotted the relationship, it would generate an exponential rate. So you have an exponentially fewer very large centers and exponentially many more as a long tail of very small centers, just like the data that I showed in the first place actually illustrates. There, this is how um, store patterns are really distributed. Um, another maybe more um, specific or, or useful um, economic model um, here is presented by Wheaton and T. Pascale, who, who describe through this small equation that I'll go through very briefly, the, how the distance between stores, which is the inverse of density, but how far competing stores selling the same thing are from each other, is determined by four different factors. Fixed costs of running a store, K, which is transportation costs, V, which is the frequency of purchases, and F, which is the customer density. How these four factors explain the density of stores of any kind in cities. So they say, just like in the Kristaller model, that in equilibrium, um, the competing um, 
types of stores would space themselves equally. They, instead of a two-dimensional field, they just show it on a linear one-dimensional line. But in essence, the stores are still exactly the same distance apart from each other. But this distance is not just a result of these threshold and range ideas, which are very vague, but it's actually a result of four very specific economic impacts. So let's look at how they react. So these are just descriptive statistics. You can already see that, for instance, when C, um, if you decrease C, if fixed costs come down, then the distance between stores also comes down. They're proportional to each other. But everything that's on the denominator below the division line, if, if, that, if they go up, if transportation goes up, if customer frequency goes up, or if customer density goes up, then the distance between stores actually comes down rather than going up. So let's see how that works. This is fixed costs. Uh, when I worked in Indonesia, uh, there's lots and lots of businesses on streets that have super, like, almost extremely low fixed costs. It takes one person to operate a food business that is basically on a cart. The person goes to the market in the morning, then they cook the food, they don't have any staff, they have no electricity bills, no rent to pay, and it's extremely low um, cost operation. And you actually have a huge density of those in cities. When we did a survey in Solo with students looked at in Indonesia how many of these businesses were there, the uh, business number of businesses per capita was all, almost twice as high as we have in Cambridge, US, which is arguably a pretty well-served city um, um, in the US context. So lowering fixed costs produces higher density of stores or lesser dis distances between stores. Now, the opposite is true when fixed costs go high. Um, there's a famous case in New York uh, on Bleecker Street, which catapulted to world fame uh, by this TV show, Sex and the City. There's a cupcake store in Bleecker Street that became extremely popular as a result of the show. And then Bleecker Street became almost like Fifth Avenue. It's only super high-end brands. Now, the prices on Bleecker Street have gone so high that almost even the luxury store can't afford it anymore. The prices in Bleecker Street are something like $800 per square foot per year, uh, which is, you know, it's like Fifth Avenue prices in New York City. And there's uh, several articles have come out in the le recent couple of years how even the luxury stores that only did it for advertising value can't afford to be there anymore. And Bleecker Street is emptying out of retail because landlord greed, essentially. So this illustrates the point that when fixed costs go up, even extremely high, then the distances bet between stores become large and the store density um, drops. Now, the effect of customer density, uh, if any of you have, um, so the effect is basically very intuitive that if you have a higher density of customers, you basically have a higher density city, all else equal, then the distances between stores are shorter and the density of stores is higher. Maybe the most extreme case that I could think of or have also visited is the district of Mong Kok in Kowloon, um, uh, part of Hong Kong, um, city. And in, in Kowloon, the population density is easily over 100,000 people per square kilometer. At, in some areas, it's even double that. Uh, and the store density, if any of you have ever visited uh, Mong Kok, is just extraordinary. There are um, service businesses who have a sign on the door that says, take 12 floors of stairs up to visit the shoe cobbler or something like that. It's just the most extreme store density that I've ever seen in terms of um, um, well, density of stores and very short distance between stores. And in this case, it's largely the effect of very high population densities. Uh, the opposite is true if population densities come down. So if population densities decrease, you start having long distances between stores. That's what the model predicts. And as we, I'll talk a little bit about Tallinn in this context. Um, the frequency of visits I already mentioned or alluded to is very important, like taxidermy stores are very infrequently visited, therefore we see a few of them. I mean, a good example might be in Paris, there's just a, such a culture of consuming um, pastries and baguettes, and the density of uh, pastry shops or bakeries around town is higher than uh, most cities you would see in Europe. So this is a result of a cultural effect of people's purchase patterns to certain types of goods are very high, and other types of stores where people visit very infrequently or very rarely, you have very few of those stores. You don't see a lot of them. Mostly curious tourists like myself trying to wonder how that store ever survives. Um, then transportation costs, and I'll go into that a little bit more in de detail because Tallinn, I think, is this is one of the most important effects playing out on uh, retail densities or distributions in Tallinn. Uh, generally, if transportation costs are high, that means it is expensive to move one kilometer. 
then store density is also high and the distance between stores very low. Venice, Italy is maybe the best example because there's no cars in Venice. The store density in Venice is extraordinarily high. I, I've compared it to Los Angeles, for instance, and it's something like 100 times the density of stores that LA has you have in Venice per square kilometer, if we just look at this per kilometer distribution. Um, and on the other hand, if transportation costs are low, and in this, the way that transportation costs are uh, in, conceived in this case is not just the cost, it's the full cost, including time. So in Venice, the costs are high, not because we pay gasoline or buy tickets, but because it's, it takes a lot of time to cross a kilometer on foot compared to a car. That's why the full cost of transportation is high on foot versus by car. The full uh, cost of transportation per mile actually is quite low. So if transportation costs per mile become low, then the distances between stores explode. And so there's obviously um, a, a sort of gradient in terms of what type of transportation makes sense at different distances. So at very small distances, if all modes are possible or available, it usually makes sense to walk. But this is challenged, or this is not the case if the infrastructure is not there, or if the built environment is not conducive to walking. This only holds if all of the options are present. At, after a certain point, biking becomes the most economical means, after which is public transit, then cars, then high-speed rail, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, generally, um, per mile, these costs are much cheaper than walking, and any, mo any city that capitalizes on longer distance travel will also have longer distances between stores. So um, this is maybe um, shown, especially in cities where quick change has happened, like Tallinn. We used to have a very, very high um, public transportation mode share. That means that most people would commute by public transit or walk in the 1980s. And as Lydia already demonstrated, uh, we've actually increased uh, the automotive mode share at an explosive rate. And the number of cars in, in Estonia has grown about sixfold or sevenfold by now compared to the 1980s standard. So there's an enormous explosion. And this explosion in, in motorization and cars has directly translated into land use changes, especially in retail, where we moved away from this sort of corner shop economy uh, to large centers at the urban edges. In fact, Estonia, uh, or Tallinn specifically, ranks the highest of all European cities in terms of shopping center space per person. There's about 1.35 square meters of shopping center space per person, which is higher than any other uh, city in Europe, and I'm sure you've all been to many of these. And as Lady says, it's not only um, sort of a sort of urbanistic or urban design effect, these have very serious economic consequences. I've mapped here the ownership patterns of shopping centers. Th these are like the actual investors behind shopping centers in Tallinn, and many, many of these are not local. Um, these, these investors essentially pump money out of Tallinn as the consumer class is now driving and spending all their um, sort of monthly grocery and, and other um, fees um, in these centers. Now, the opposite is takes place if we have a high pedestrian and public transit mode share. If you have, if it's expensive to move long distances and the city is conducing, conducive to moving short distances, then the retail market responds and you actually get a, a more of street commerce, more of um, shorter distances between stores, higher retail densities. So uh, that's one of the most consequ consequential things that I think is under undergoing in Tallinn is that we are changing transportation patterns and these transportation changes that have already been underway for two decades uh, or three decades uh, take a toll or take a very strong impact on land use location patterns in particular in retail, but also of course in housing and office uh, landscapes, et cetera. So uh, the takeaway point here is that if transportation systems encourage short trips, whether on foot, by bike, or by public transit, then generally smaller retail centers remain viable or retail densities rise and distances between stores shrink. And I think there is almost these two um, cyclical development paths that many cities face. And it's, it's really about like which loop do we want to go into. On the one hand, you have loop maybe B, where if you have lower density environments, these lower density environments encourage longer trips per person. Uh, these longer trips um, encourage a higher automotive motor, and that essentially further encourages shorter um, or sparser retail developments or larger distances between stores. I think we've gone from the A pattern to the B pattern in the last um, 25 years in Tallinn. The A pattern is 
the opposite, where if you have a higher density built environment, it encourages shorter trips between places, and that encourages higher rates of walkability and public transit ridership, which in turn feeds back into um, the denser uh, retail environments. Um, in the context of Tallinn, how we've moved from A to B, I think, um, is attributable to a whole range of things. But I just want to emphasize, and I'm not going to go into these details, uh, I want to emphasize it's not a natural phenomenon, like many people in the media are currently debating, that this is just how things are. This is natural to Tallinn. It's this kind of city in the dark, and the, you know, people like to drive because it's cold, etc. This is a result of policies as much as anything else. And these policies include, for instance, um, in the 90s, I mean, literally, Tallinn subsidized suburbanization. Tallinn city paid for infrastructure in, in the um, outlying districts, paving roads, um, sewage systems, et cetera, encouraging people to move out. Um, we don't have zoning that encourages higher density development around transit, and so on and so on. So there's a whole list of policies that one could point to that are, have, uh, that are partially um, related to what happened in terms of why this six-fold motorization increase was possible, which is probably one of the largest motorization jumps of any European city in history. Um, I also want to mention that when we talk about transportation, then what's very important for where retail locates in cities um, is accessibility, because I mentioned the combination of transportation costs and uh, how many customers are around, or this customer density idea, this can be thought of in terms of accessibility. And accessibility is not evenly distributed all over the city. In places that have higher accessibility, you have higher retail densities. This is a perfect example where we are. Baltiam is one of the best accessible places in town. Uh, it has the regional train station, it has the tramways, it has a pretty robust bus station, it has roads, and the retail density around Baltiam is not just serving people who can live or work around here, it's serving a much larger clientele. So accessibility has a direct impact, of course, on retail densities. And as a nice example, even if you take that economic model that Wheaton and Di Pascali developed on a linear line, uh, if you just did one simple move, which is rearrange that line of nine stores into the shape of a cross that is no longer a linear line, but you constrain the environment into a cross shape, then even following the exact same economic math, the equilibrium state looks different. The equilibrium state in this case would have a concentration of five stores in the center because now with that concentration, all stores market areas are equal to each other. So this is an example of how accessibility shapes clustering uh, because the higher accessibility locations, which in this case is the center of the cross, naturally provides better access to customers along these lines fanning out in four directions, and therefore, in equilibrium, stores would need to be closer to each other because they would split these customers evenly with each other. And this plays out in real urban environments all over the world. In Tallinn, it means that, for instance, much of the shopping center development has occurred at critical uh, road junctions where you have high accessibility by car, whether it's in Ulemiste or Cristina or Pernomante and other places. Um, one, other, one other quality that... Um, really, really uh, matters for street commerce in particular. I mean, it also matters for shopping centers, but in the form of cars. For street commerce, it matters in, in particular uh, on, for pedestrians is how many people pass by a location. So accessibility doesn't just deal with how many people can get to a location on planned or purposeful trips. But what matters for stores is also how many people might just be passing by without any planned uh, plans for purchases. And this is very, fairly well estimatable um, with, with spatial modeling tools. We can look at, if you have, for instance, uh, origins and destinations in the city, you can estimate you know, what locations in the city are probably going to be uh, facing highest pedestrian densities, how, highest people throughput in, in, in traveling uh, through the city. Uh, this is significant for street commerce because several research projects have found that pedestrians and bicyclists actually too are much more likely to do unplanned purchases that in stores they pass than drivers. TfL, the Transport for London, uh, who's done a big study on this, found that in London, pedestrians are 65% more likely to spend in a store than a driver passing by a store. So looking for locations where you have a lot of passersby is critical, and we have lots of spatial analysis tools that can do that to model not just between two locations, but with many locations, what are the likely most pedestrian traffic places in the city. And I know there's a research project here in ECA with Rene Busep and uh, the research team also developing such tools to, to really model pedestrian flows, which I think is a critical ingredient for, for street commerce in the context of Tallinn. So, uh, the takeaway point I want to emphasize with these transportation ideas is that uh, 
when we talk about accessibility to locations, then accessibility is not only about how close a destination is, but also how large a destination is. So accessibility is actually a combination of attractiveness and distance, or attractiveness and travel cost. And so the more accessible locations are those that are either closer to amenities or closer to more attractive amenities. Um, and retailers actually work as a system. Uh, if you think about, I mean, there's a famous model called the Huff retail patronage model that uh, can predict how many people are going to what center given the distribution of where people are living or working. Um, and what it very illust clearly illustrates is that retail works as a system in a city. If you add capacity here, you are going to diminish capacity somewhere else. It's like a water table that if you press water down here, it goes up here and so on. So we need to start thinking about this in Tallinn because every time we permit another shopping center like the T1 now at Ulemiste, this has direct impact on other uh, viabilities for shops in different parts of the city. And we've already seen how that played out, the hollowing out of um, the sort of corner shop retail from the city center as a result of this ring of large shopping centers around the city center. Um, so I want to touch uh, briefly just two more um, topics of what shapes the retail pattern. Um, one is that we oftentimes notice stores clustering, right? Um, there's clustering. Um, um, that you um, have in, uh, let's see, that's complementary clustering, where you have stores that complement each other. So for instance, like an ice cream kiosk next to, next to a theater, which is fairly intuitive, and there's a very sort of clear reason why that would happen to save time and transportation costs. But there's also sometimes competitive clustering, like restaurants next to restaurants, bookstores next to bookstores, shoe stores next to shoe stores. And this is something that you see in many cities. I just want to explain this through a sort of interesting story. Um, in 1956, um, when Brasilia was first developed by Lucio Costa and Oscar Niemeyer, there was this idea of a super block, and I'm sure many of the architects in the room know about this. The idea was that the super block has 3,000 people in it, and at the edge of the super block, there's a retail strip, this black strip. And the idea was that each retail strip would serve its own super block. So this one would face up here, and people would come from the houses and go to stores and go back, and from this block, people would come here and go back. This was the plan. As soon as Brasilia was built, um, an interesting thing happened. Two, actually, two things happened. First, these retail strips immediately flipped over. What was designed as a st store facing the block, people changed the facade and rebuilt it from the back, which was actually supposed to be delivery trucks. The stores turned around and started facing each other, essentially forming a double-sided street and, and also attracting, therefore, customers from both blocks at the same time rather than one block, so maximizing their customer catchment. And second thing that happened, they specialized. So it wasn't like what was supposed to be the idea is that each strip serves everything, like groceries and household goods and flowers and haircuts and all of that. Uh, they specialized, and now there's like a flower street, and there's like a beauty salon street, and there's a restaurant cluster, and they no longer actually, or never really worked as the architects intended. It was lucky for them because they, it was a very cheap conversion, but it could have really gone much more wrong, which I think we witnessed in many of the uh, districts in Estonia, like uh, the retail provisions in places like Lasna Magi or Annelin in Tartu are still very much constrained by the urban design ideas. They never actually adopted a proper retail pattern uh, till this day. Uh, so this is what they actually look like. They're double-sided. So um, complementary clustering essentially things that um, complement each other, and, and I won't go into that. Uh, but comp competitive clustering is much more interesting. So why do things like bookstores cluster with, with each other or restaurants cluster with each other? There's really three dominant explanations in sort of retail economic theory about this. One is that um, uh, the oldest one is an explanation by Hotelling, Harold Hotelling from the 20s, that explained that you know, sometimes by uh, clustering with uh, like stores, uh, uh, stores can reduce the risk. So he explained it with sort of ice cream vendors on the beach, if you've heard of the example, but the idea is basically that you know, it would be optimal from a social perspective to have two ice cream vendors on a beach be equally spaced apart so they distribute themselves over the beach but then if one kiosk starts moving towards the other, it can immediately grab more customers and it would be an incentive to go as close as possible to the other vendor to have all of the customers taken away from the other. So they would kind of enter this game and at, at, there's a secondary equilibrium called the Nash equilibrium in which they actually locate in the middle of the beach rather than at the optimal locations uh, from the customer's point of view. And at the middle of the beach, they still make as much money, but now the customers have to walk considerably more. 
Um, the more modern explanations actually have to do with price and product comparison. So many people like to compare things before they spend. So that if they if similar stores cluster uh, next to each other, that enables that. And also prices tend to be lower in competitive clusters. So if we actually empirically look what clusters with what, and this is data based on uh, Cambridge uh, and Somerville US that I've estimated personally, um, then the clustering coefficient is highest amongst uh, sporting, hobby, and music stores, and bookstores. And these stores are the highest likely, have the highest likelihood to be right next to each other, followed by food services, which are restaurants and bars, basically, followed by electronic stores um, and clothing stores. But what's also interesting is that the last two categories of stores, so no significant clustering. Uh, so they don't necessarily cluster uh, with each other, and this is also perfectly explained by the theory because they are called convenience to stores rather than com um, uh, comparison stores. So things that sell convenience goods like groceries uh, or um, you could say alcohol or um, household goods, they generally don't cluster with each other because uh, people have no incentive or no interest in going from one store to the other to compare their goods. Um, so the last kind of substantive topic I want to evoke is uh, organization, which is, I think, also relevant for Tallinn. Um, there is a sort of inherent inequality between shopping centers and Main Street kind of street commerce. Uh, this in inequality comes from the fact that shopping centers are actually organized halls. They're centrally managed. There is a manager who can decide what stores can come in, and more importantly, the manager can give rent incentives to get more attractive stores to come in. And this is very, very common practice. It's called discriminatory lease uh, contracts. So basically, if you are a very popular store, like maybe H&M, oftentimes in shopping centers, you get a very favorable deal. In return, you generate spillover customers for other stores, and the shopping center owner therefore recuperates that loss by charging higher rents from neighboring stores. Sometimes it's to the point where large anchor stores pay no rent at all. They cut zero costs or even get uh, subsidies in the form of construction, parking, primary access, and so on, in order just to create these customer spillovers. Now, this doesn't happen in the cities because there is no joint ownership. And it's argued, I mean, several econom economists have tried to argue that this coordination capability is the primary reason why shopping centers have come so quickly and dominated the world. It's nothing more than it's, it's basically orchestration of retail with very personally tailored financial subsidies for stores. And that's what enables the store kind of cluster to exist and the, to be made as attractive as possible to bring as many customers in it and as you can. This doesn't exist in fragmented urban context where you have lots of different landlords who cannot, for instance, you know, if somebody in this carnival store said, boy, I'm going to give out this space for free uh, to this, uh, this very attractive store, they completely lose out and then VS Cafe would catch all the spillover customers next door, right? This doesn't make any sense if you have no coordinated body between them. And this actually makes a huge difference in terms of retail sales. If we, this data is from Los Angeles, but I think it holds in other cities too, where we look at the same types of stores, uh, which is uh, retail, food, or service stores in shopping centers. In every category, the uh, average uh, sales per, um, per employee, or per, per establishment in this case, sorry, uh, is considerably higher than in, in urban clusters. So the, in urban clusters, store make, stores tend to make less money, and it's usually attributable to the fact that the shopping centers have this sort of choreographed whole, choreographed cluster of stores, which maximizes store revenues. However, there's lots of public benefits from street commerce. So as I've already alluded to in the beginning, um, they're, they're socially more beneficial. They generate actually uh, genuine serendipity and, um, and sort of contribute to the quality of the public realm. They are more robust against market shifts and downturns and the profits don't flow out of the country uh, and so on and so on. So you could argue that there's this sort of two opposing models that are battling each other in many cities, including Tallinn, that there is the sort of uh, idea of a shopping center which is like a fully coordinated cluster, one owner, one management policy, and they can sort of control the whole thing. And then there's this fragmented ownership pattern where you know, it works because of good historic reasons, because of good access, et cetera, but it doesn't generate the same sort of financial benefits to the store. Actually, there's a third model that has uh, come in, and this is in the form of, in both transformation of how modern shopping centers look and also transformation of street commerce. So the, what hasn't quite come to Estonia yet, but my prediction is that it will soon, 
uh, which is this type of shopping center very popular in the US now and increasingly other European cities called the Lifestyle Center. Essentially, the Lifestyle Center is a shopping center that uh, pretends not to be a shopping center. It looks like the Main Street, and all of the circulation is outdoors. It's basically, um, uh, they call it, it's the shopping center for people who hate shopping centers. It's, 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 the idea is that you take off the roof, you make it look like street commerce, and you mix up the uses. So there's a little bit of housing, a little bit of offices, definitely entertainment like cinemas in there. And what typically characterizes them is these use mixes, uh, also, also catering to higher income customers, and it's like outdoor feeling of a main street. There's quite a few of those. A uh, very famous case from LA is the Grove. In fact, this shopping center um, attracts more people than Disneyland to LA. Uh, and it's all single ownership. It's actually, in terms of ownership and, and financial model, it's the exact same thing as the old shopping center. It's just made to look different like the Main Street. Um, in Tallinn, we have a couple of um, those, I, I think, or, almost organically. Um, much of Rottermanni is owned by, uh, you probably know who, and uh, is basically one entity. Uh, the difference is perhaps that it's not coordinated. I think the... Um, the company that owns much of Rotterdam tries to extract maximum rent from every store, and therefore many stores don't survive there. They don't quite use this sort of uh, strategy of coordinating rents and giving free lease to some stores so that they would benefit other stores yet. But one place that does it very successfully is Teliskivi. Teliskivi is also one ownership model. It's essentially like a shopping center, but it gives subsidies to very many small creative entrepreneurs, which create the whole buzz and attract people to it, and then extract much higher than average rents from large operators who want to throw events there, who want to rent larger space. Essentially works like a shopping center with this coordinated lease structure. Um, there's actually, so these are like what's happening to shopping centers, but from a Main Street point of view, an interesting development is that there's also this organizational model that starts to uh, bind or, or relate uh, Main Street type of stores to each other too, and this is called the Business Improvement District. Um, in the U.S. context. It has a few different names, like a business association sometimes and so on. What, what it essentially is is that a bunch of landlords or property owners come together and vote to establish like a, a cordon around the district in which they agree to pay higher property taxes than regular. And within that cordon, therefore, these property taxes can be used by the business association to spend only locally. So usually a bid, or it's usually called like a bid, uh, it's a public-private partnership where the local government agrees to serve as the tax collector. So the taxes are actually collected by the local government, but they are funneled back to the organization, which has a board who can decide how to spend it locally. And usually they spend it on things like uh, better upkeep, uh, festivals, sometimes security, et cetera, um, on the street. Um, there's a whole lot of them. Um, um, and one of the most important things they also do besides um, better upkeep and security is they engage in marketing. So these business associations, they very proactively go looking for tenants. So if somebody on a street in a business improvement district has a tenant leaving, they very proactively go and look for new tenants that would fit into the cluster. So essentially they're, ser they're delivering some of the services that the shopping center does, but they put it on the sort of Main Street environment and uh, maybe what's more positive than the shopping center is that they retain individual ownership. So there's a fragmented body of owners. There's many different owners who still make the profits individually, but this organization helps them coordinate between each other. And that's something that I think is worth considering in, in some areas of Tallinn. So if you look at downtown Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles is essentially covered with bids. Every kind of square foot of downtown is part of some bid. It's the arts district. It's the... Uh, the Chinatown or the, uh, there's little, little Japan, there's, there's all in all in LA, I think there's um, 40 something, I don't have the number here, uh, 41, yeah, in, in LA total. So there's, it's a very popular model um, and they do things like uh, events and marketing, they throw like car free Sundays, they close down the street and organize um, uh, many people to come around, they do upkeep, they do business recruitment, public space management, they actually put landscaping and plants with their own budgets on city streets and, and upgrades. So they form, they form like a quasi-public authority that, that does things that the public sector can't afford to do or doesn't want to do in, in certain areas of the town. But the evidence in terms of their actual um, profitability is very uh, divided still. So there's some uh, people who have suggested that you know, that they, they benefit large stores um, or, or large landlords and not so much 
lower ones, when I tried to estimate how, um, how beneficial they were, then if we look at sales per employee uh, in retail sector, in full sector, in personal uh, services, then whether it's in a bid or not, the um, revenues were very, very similar in Los Angeles. So I couldn't find any like inherent sort of financial benefit of their performance in the context of LA, but others have been very adamant about advocating for their benefits. So there's, it kind of enters as a third model. So you have the shopping center, you have the fragmented street commerce, and this kind of business improvement district model is something in between that provides certain level of coordination. And you could sort of, in the local context, imagine, for instance, if, if Narva Monte, as part of the Italian new Main Street, would have a business association between all of the different store owners along Narva Monte, who would then coordinate opening hours, coordinate festivals and events on the Main Street, or, or do business recruitment. So if somebody loses a tenant, that they would go after some new tenants and try to kind of uh, fill in the holes that would be sort of the equivalent of what much of the bids do in um, other countries. Um, so um, I, I just want to finish by saying that I think in the context of Tallinn, uh, as I've tried to describe, the presence of street commerce is related actually to many other things. And street commerce cannot be achieved by a planner saying, let there be street commerce. Obviously, it is related to bigger economic forces. It's related to transportation, to cultural consumption habits. It's related to costs of running a business. It's related to urban density. And many of these things um, kind of collide to produce street commerce. And that's why I, I started out by saying that street commerce is sort of like a barometer of the health of um, many things behind it uh, and, and, and something that indicates how certain uh, kind of transportation effects and urban form uh, cooperate to produce street commerce. Um, and I think we, we still have an opportunity here in Tallinn to kind of decide which way we want to go. If we produce more and more car-oriented sort of suburban growth, we're going to perpetuate the shopping center development, et cetera. Or if we want to seriously advocate for policies that would encourage street commerce, then all of these things uh, have to do with urban density. They have to do with transportation costs, walking and, and especially public transportation ridership and, and so on. And so I've, I've picked out um, a few cities for comparison here from the US and looked at, okay, in reality, sort of if we, if we put this to actual test, which cities do have street commerce to the, to the point where more than half of the people in the city can walk to a cluster of street commerce from their house? And so all of the cities in this upper bracket are generally very high. So 88% or 60, or on average, they have 61% people within walking reach of a street commerce cluster from their house in the US. And there are, what this table is trying to demonstrate is that this quality or achieving this quality relates very much also to urban form and density. These cities generally have high population um, uh, density. So actually, population itself varies a lot. It can be small town, it can be big town, but they uniformly have high population density. Uh, uh, on average, 4,400 people per square kilometer citywide. They have high FAR, one or over on average, um, and, but it can be achieved at lower rates too, and they have uh, pretty, pretty high ground coverage. That means buildings occupy a lot of the ground, and there's not a whole lot of empty space between them. In cases where very low percentages of population have access, walking access to a street commerce cluster nearby their house. The opposite is true. Population densities are four times lower. FAR is five times lower. And ground coverage is uh, close to three times lower. So obviously, urban form and density are a huge part of the picture. And to foster, in the long term, street commerce, you have to have density um, in the cities. It's very hard to imagine that being achieved in low density cities. And if we, I take some of the cities and plot uh, you know, on a full graph how many people in what city have, uh, what percentage of the population has walking access to a retail cluster, then in New York City, across the five boroughs, it's 88%. Actually, in Manhattan, which is the densest borough of New York, 100% of the population can walk to a retail cluster from their house. So this is the highest density place in the United States. But it goes down rapidly. And, and you have cities like, for instance, Mem Memphis, Tennessee, where you have only 6% um, of the population with walking access to um, uh, a, a retail cluster on a street. And um, these cities have uh, certain development patterns. These densities and these FARs and these ground coverage numbers, they actually uh, manifest in, in, in particular urban morphologies um, that you can study. Or you know, it, in the context of Tallinn, too, uh, where density is concentrated and, and how the morphology is distributed um, has a direct impact. 
on the retail uh, patterns too. So um, I think in our case here in Tallinn, a few of the policies that would really go a long way towards uh, encouraging uh, more uh, street-based and maybe sort of diverse equitable retail uh, distribution would be uh, serious investments into public transit, uh, transit first traffic policies, which is already part of what the city is doing, sort of giving priority to public transit over cars on the city streets, uh, relieving parking requirements in transit served areas, um, uh, encouraging transit oriented development or higher density um, around uh, transit served locations, um, in sometimes zoning things for uh, ground floor retail or service or amenity uses in flexible ways. Um, uh, urban growth boundaries potentially, or sort of putting some kind of a stop on, on suburban sprawl or um, edge development. Uh, considering in some cases, and this is not something that the city would do, but would maybe uh, property owners or business owners could consider in some cases, a form of business associations or business improvement district could serve as a vehicle for organized action uh, in, for instance, a Pernomante stretch or, or Narvamante stretch or some other uh, centers. Um, and um, I would also argue that every time a city uh, faces a new permit request for a, a shopping center larger than, uh, say, maybe two, even 2,000 square meters or something, uh, that there will be an impact study done to understand its impact on the existing patterns of stores citywide, which we still don't do. And it, it really uh, befuddles me how uh, already being the top shopping center city in all of Europe, uh, we build another one like T1 right next to two existing ones and, and do not take into account the aggregate impact that that could have uh, on the distribution in the city. So let me stop there and we can maybe have a joint discussion. Thank you. I, um, actually, I have, and the reason why I didn't, this was already overloaded with content, the only reason I left it out of this presentation is because I thought everybody knows these principles here. That this is pretty intuitive, things like, you know, um, um, having uh, two-sided rather than one-sided retail strips, so you double the number of stores you can get to within the same amount of time. Uh, things like not, you know, not advocating for load-bearing walls on the streets on commercial buildings that you cannot alter over time, not advocating for lowered or heightened ground floors which break up sight lines to stores. And there's a whole list uh, of architectural and urban design qualities that, of course, any retailer needs to have. And I think the best example of where those qualities have completely failed and as a consequence retail has not come is the sort of over-optimized housing architecture of the Soviet Union in places like Glasnama or Anderlin. Uh, it's the early 90s, and I lived through that personally, many of you probably did too. The, the nascent retail sector tried to come. The first thing was the, the kiosks. You know, they put up kiosks everywhere. They would sell like groceries and clothes and meat and cigarettes and everything. And then they tried to go to the basements. And now still you have basement stores in Tallinn, etc. These are very unideal. And the building typology was so rigid that you cannot convert a apartment block into any reasonable retail possibility. They, they couldn't occupy even the first floors because they would have to share the circulation with the upstairs units and people would never agree to have strangers in their stairwells. They couldn't, you know, even the basement shops actually were totally illegal because they took away the secondary exit from the back, which was, according to fire code, needed, uh, and so on. So this is a perfect example of how urban typology or building typologies were the opposite of what worked. And they were also spaced far apart. There was no sort of concentration of people and et cetera. But I think these, these principles are much well, generally very intuitive and well known to all the architects in the room. Uh, 
Thanks a lot, which uh, right. you can, uh, like, you can find it in Google, it will be stored. And will yeah. Uh, this was data from uh, Credit Info, uh, who tracks all businesses in Estonia. The categories uh, that were part of that, uh, I, I anticipated your question. <laughs> <laughs> this is the categories that are part of that, those clusters that I uh, included there. But it's, it's an it's a address level um, database of businesses in Estonia, so I just uh, did a so And I wouldn't say that... Sorry? You're working through all of this data of businesses in Estonia? Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's a lot easier with a computer. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, uh, and I also wouldn't argue that it's super precise or reliable. There's many faults and mistakes. And so this is a very quick stab, and I wouldn't say this is an official map of clusters. I think it would need a lot of validation on the ground, but it's, it's one data set that is available. Yeah. Yeah. So no, uh, how so does this the clusters also have to satisfy the real needs of citizens yeah. or like the population who comes and passes? So I, I, I fully agree with you. I would never argue that Venice is the, the poster child of good retail. Uh, the only point I tried to dis sort of illustrate with Venice is the fact that because it has very high transportation costs, it also produces very high retail densities. Um, and it has other factors that align to the, the sort of building density and so on. But um, what I tried to show is that the stores are very frequently spaced, they're dense, and that's largely a factor of transportation because there's, no, there's only walking in Venice. Uh, but it doesn't, it's not a commentary that these stores offer good choices or they're high quality, uh, essentially. You know, Venice is largely catering to tourists, just like Tallinn Old Town, and it's uh, not an example of the quality, it's just a sort of um, the transportation effect on the density. Right. And it's usually like this historical model jumping to this big shopping center just to have it covered in all in one space. So if I need here, I have to go to all the stores to find it. And I can do it in one space and like a waste, waste uh, time and energy for it. I also have legal be fun, like to have uh, snacks or whatever. Right. That's true. <laughs> and we have to respect it if we want to run business like a urban planning in this country. Sure, sure. No, I, I think that's true. There's a cultural dimension to cooperation, and Estonians are more individualist than many others. But I think there are forms. I mean, we have, we have several types of unions. We have all kinds of forms of cooperation that exist economically. So I wouldn't say that. Uh, Estonians don't cooperate at all. Uh, I think it's possible, and, and especially if there's business interest. And, but I, I also want to say this business improvement district model has to be um, treat, treated with some caution. It's not all a happy story for all stores. It, and there's some conflicting literature of how impacts play out to different types of stores. But I don't think this is 
out of uh, possibility. I, I do think it is possible, and it doesn't mean that every owner has to individually participate like a cooperative member. It could be outsourced to a third-party company who does the coordination on behalf of the landlords or something like that, which would facilitate matters. But on, in, in terms of your sort of examples of um, shopping centers being more comfortable, et cetera, uh, I, I would, I mean, what I also tried to communicate in the talk was um, the fact that it's available as it is today, and we already experienced it, is a result of lots of very ser deliberate policy choices as well. It's not just a sort of natural phenomenon that appeared and now it's very comfortable to have that. It comes with a lot of costs, uh, a lot of hidden costs in particular that are spread through taxpayers. Um, and it, it's not something that is a natural given. I mean, this is supported. And similarly, if, if we had better street commerce in Tallinn, if we had more walkable downtown centers, et cetera, I think people would love it with the same way. There's plenty of examples from northern countries, whether it's Finland or whether it's uh, Stockholm or whether it's uh, Copenhagen, where you have had this sort of revival before, and everybody said before, too, that it was not possible uh, to, to revitalize or sort of curb the motorization trends, or let's say Zurich in, in Switzerland, which is also a clo fairly cold climate with, with strong winters. Uh, so I don't think it's uh, a natural phenomenon. And besides, I mean, Tallinn has a history of over a thousand years before uh, the arrival of um, 1991, uh, where this, the streets worked as they did. You know, it's not a shopping center type of city. Uh, so I, I, I think there's a little bit more to it. Um, it's not a. It's like it's considered to make a uh, building. For example, this old town area is quite high density and already existing cluster. Is it possible to reconsider on like master plan for, for new using? Mm. Like for, for new function or something with the more value in the I I mean Old Town is a very specific case where the the only change could be regulatory. Physically it's frozen in time now. You, you can't change anything physically, right? So um, but it's in terms of um, policy, I do think there could be things like we could put a limit on, on the number of banks on the ground floor or the number of amber shops. I mean, you could try to uh, incentivize uh, different types of business. It's not, of course, possible for the government to say that you have to have this business here, but it's possible to create the incentives for it, for instance, to, with, through tax breaks and financial incentives to, to bolster some sort of activity more than others, or to invest into, for instance, transit, which would then feed certain businesses as a sort of side effect. And so there's ways in which I do think the old town could be improved and, uh, from its current state. Maybe we can take some for Lily. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lily. I know that it's been very interesting. Um, but I'll hold it off um, when we can uh, see these issues. But um, uh, I have several questions, but maybe something that uh, uh, have you looked into the impact of uh, e-commerce and on this online shopping on this uh, street, street level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I have, and uh, it's uh, one of the sort of big changes right now that's undergoing in many countries and many cities. Uh, I tend to think that the uh, expectations of a sort of a e-commerce killing brick and mortar commerce is totally overblown. Uh, it's existed for centuries, and and if 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 anything, I think that the sort of the type of shopping that uh, is tedious and is a chore will move increasingly online. And so far, only for people who can afford it. And it really, I mean, at some point, there's a sort of li cost limit. You, if everybody orders a pencil by a UPS truck or a pair of socks every day, it simply is not financially feasible. It's currently heavily subsidized. I mean, all of these distribution companies like DHL, UPS, who deliver Amazon goods, they operate at a loss doing so because they don't want to lose Amazon as a client. And uh, I think, uh, there, so it's the impact is somewhat overestimated in the media, I think. But at the same time, 
uh, I do think that there are certain things that city governments should do very immediately to counteract that. So for instance, one of the things is uh, relaxing the specificity of zoning. So many cities have a very specific zoning category that this can be only a restaurant, this can be only a, a retail store, and this can be only a personal service or a dentist shop. I think these categories are oftentimes unnecessary to begin with, and just opening it up and saying this can be an activity generating ground floor use is a better strategy and, and can combat some of this uh, uh, trend that e-commerce is threatening the stores. Uh, and I think there's many other things. So for instance, I think organizing more public events on physical space can kind of remind people that face-to-face -face interaction is far superior uh, to, I mean, people still love it, right? If, if physical interaction is much in, superior to a lot of the online exchange. And, and uh, uh, I think through creating more experiences or sort of uh, public value out of brick and mortar commerce, is another strategy that cities would use to combat um, some of these threats. And of course, I mean, what we shouldn't also forget that e-commerce for, since its development has literally run tax-free. E-commerce is not getting taxed like physical commerce and many cities are now, or even national governments are introducing taxation for e-commerce, which would put it on an equal playing field. Uh, there's no reason why, you know, Amazon should get away without paying taxes, whereas when you go to a shopping center, you pay uh, uh, full tax. Maybe Estonia is not the case. I don't know how much the international companies, uh, how that's handled here. But in the U.S. context, you don't pay sales tax when you order online, but you pay sales tax when you go to the store. If some of our <clears throat> students um, who are doing masters in urban planning and design are really interested in this question of e-commerce and then what does it mean for stores on the street. And I think um, one of the exciting things our students are aware of is that what you buy online is not necessarily the things you go like around the corner for. You know, you might be cooking something and you run out of pepper, or you know, your baby, you know, might need new diapers or something. And so, kind of that idea that there's certain things that e-commerce will take away, but the things mundane life where you need corner stores are very, very important. And so that kind of zoning to make sure that corner stores can stay there, but also being kind of strategic and thinking about policy. So, you know, right now, at least in the States, um, e-commerce delivers in front of your doorstep, like three days, three times a day, you know, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong packages, right? Because there's different mail alerts. And then um, if they could regulate the use of curbs mm -hmm. so that they had to instead deliver it to a corner store where there's lockers, you know, these are policy ideas that promote the use of the street corner store so that people are then and they are forced to go to the store. They're, they're, they have to walk there, right? Yeah. And then once you get there, then you're like, you know how people are, oh, oh, I want this and I want that, you know? And it kind of helps that situation a lot. So these things, there's nothing natural about e-commerce taking away retail. There's very many room, you know, places for us to intervene. Did you have another? Oh, hello. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Lili and Andres, for your lectures, it's very nice to have you back again. I have a question to Lily. Uh, I was a little bit intrigued uh, by one of the titles of the, of the slide that you, that you showed us, and it was, why do cities tend to be more un, unequal? Um, can you reflect upon, the, upon that um, question? Um, unequal to what countryside? Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, of course. So if you actually look at the data and you look at inequality within countries, for instance, cities tend to have higher rates of inequality than the nation at large. And compared to rural areas, cities tend to have more inequality as well because more very wealthy people and more very low income people tend to be present in the same area. Now, when I say cities, what I really mean is metropolitan areas. Because if you look at a city like, is Nume its own city? Used to like be, no municipality. longer. Municipality. Okay, let's Vimsi. pretend it were still. Okay, so Vimsi is its own municipality. Then there's many people of the same, not same, but more similar income range living in the same place. 
Alternatively, if Lasname were its own municipality, I know it's not because you know clearly the voting patterns that influence municipal policy. Um, then, if Lasname were its own municipality, they might also have more have lower you know inequality statistically speaking. But when you see it see it at, at a metropolitan scale, which is really the you know Italian metropolis, you have all of these income ranges, and so the income comes out much more unequal. And maybe on, along these lines, this is oftentimes the in inequality is perceived relatively. So even if the base salary is higher in cities than in the countryside, it's the range that people perceive, not the base. So even, you know, you might make minimum wage in the city and the countryside you maybe make nothing, but if there's no kind of in-your-face comparison, it's perceptions very different. Right? And, and I think the other thing I want to clarify is in and I think this is especially appropriate for Estonia, it's, I'm not saying there should not be inequality, right? Like we shouldn't all be equal regardless of our skills or backgrounds or efforts or whatever. There's always going to be inequality and I think people think that a certain level of inequality is healthy because it incentivizes people to work hard and you know to be our best selves, right? The problem is when there's inequality that's growing but also um, intergenerational mobility that's declining. And this is what we're seeing in a lot of wealthy countries. Mm. In addition, with growing inequality, there's declining intergenerational mobility. So that means that if my parents are poor, I'm likely to be poor, and my kids are likely to be poor. So advantage and disadvantage is passed on through generations. And so if you're a low-skilled rural migrant who moves to a city, this possibility of becoming, you know, a tech entrepreneur or whatever, <coughs> statistically, these things are looking very bad, and that's the thing that a lot of social scientists and social ep epidemiologists and a lot of economists, frankly, are also worried about because of all the threats, you know, to the in terms of the indicators that I presented. Hmm. And education is a big part, and that's why Estonian education, the fact that it's strong, is great but it really needs to be distributed across the way. That's actually why it's been such a hotly debated topic amongst university representatives that the Estonia has had disproportionately low investments into education and science, and they just passed a bill to raise it to 1% of the GDP level. But uh, as a comparison, I mean, literally, China is aiming to move to a 5% level. So that's... and, and uh, so 1% is, I, I think, a bare minimum, and that's a redistribution strategy. It's not just an economic growth strategy, because educational investment you, opportunity comes to more people, and not only in the form of like economics and, and computer science, but also in vocational schools and all the other trades, and that's the leveling mechanism for inequality, right? I mean, uh, to some, I mean, I would prefer that it's housing than that it's vacant. Uh, like, if it's not working as retail, then something else is better than an empty store. Uh, if it if it's really uh, perpetually empty, but I think that um, this it's not the business of a city to to really force um, stores into any place. It, it wouldn't work anyways. But it's really the sort of that's why this field is interesting to me, particularly is that it's a really complicated um, thing. There's you need to tweak almost like un indirectly factors that would create this uh, kind of emergent phenomenon of uh, street commerce. And these tweaks are not just legal in terms of saying where you have to do something or you don't. You actually have to rather create the preconditions that would deliver it. 
um, uh, through market forces. And that's, the, that's why it's actually like such a complicated thing uh, to achieve. And, but I think that's the case in a lot of urban policy. Uh, urban policy and planning has, you know, we've discovered that the sort of single sector solutions are um, weak and they don't deliver outcomes. And uh, that's why the sort of cross-sectoral collaboration in city governments is ever more important today because many, not just, not just uh, for instance, street commerce, but for instance, public health is a great example of a really, really complicated problem that requires tons of intersectoral com collaboration to achieve. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that, so I think the role of the city government in this case, in other words, is to kind of try to delve into some of the underlying issues. And um, by the way, many of the issues that help street commerce also help a lot of other good things, as I try to say. So I think it's, it's really the job of the city to, to identify what are the strategic directions of investment and, and effort that have multiple benefits at once, and then really uh, investing or, or working on these initiatives over a long period of time to, to get the outcomes. I don't. We know that. <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, I mean, I'm guessing it's the, uh, the attitude is quite simple. It's that, well, the developer bought the land and they want to do it, so why not, kind of thing. And uh, I think that's the issue that uh, we don't take into account the more complex system that the city is, that actually this has lots of externalities um, that we need to account for. I mean, there are examples of cities who have right out uh, forbid shopping malls and said that this is a policy. You cannot build anything larger than two, something like 2,000 square meter floor plate mm -hmm. of shopping, and that's it. Like Solo did it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they'll say, you know, there's been so many new shopping malls, we have a moratorium. So for the next five years, we're not permitting any more shopping malls. And at the same time, because people still need shopping options, we're going to support upgrades of markets, you know? And so these things go hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. I have a proposal. Yeah. Let's thank Andres and Lillian. Let's continue the discussion in yeah. Foyer with Prosecco and celebrate the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.